Well, right now, speaking of Mother Nature, we're going to be talking about hummingbirds and joined by Mark Klein, who's an information specialist with uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife. Uh, he heads up or is involved in the Hummingbird Roundup every year. We're going to hear a little bit about that, but welcome to the program. Great to have you with us. Great to be here, Tom. You've got a wonderful book, Hummingbirds of Texas, that we're going to be featuring today. I'm one of those folks who assumed there were only two species that we had, because that's what I usually see is just black chin hummingbirds and the ruby-throated hummingbirds. There are literally uh, uh, at least a dozen species that we can see here in central Texas. At least a dozen, probably closer to 15. Okay. Uh, how have been seen at one time or another here right. in central Texas, but the, the big ones, the common ones, are the ruby-throated, the black-chinned, and then mm. during the winter, the rufous, the annas, the calliope. Okay. With Alan sneaking in every once in a while. So it depends on what uh, which part of the migration that it's in. It depends on which part of the season you're in, yes. Right. And uh, are the, the ones that come through in the wintertime, are they just passing through or do they actually stay? We used to think that they just passed through and left, but a lot of them are actually spending the winter here in the area if mm -hmm. the conditions are right. They've got to have a little bit of shelter that they can get into on those really cold days. I've already been asked by some people, when are the Hummers going to arrive? So when do they typically show up here? Black chins come in usually late February, early March, mm -hmm. and ruby throats begin showing up late March, early April. Okay. And uh, during the Spring migration, we don't see nearly as much, many as we do in the fall. That mm -hmm. fall migration is the one that really astounds everyone, and that begins usually mid-August, early September. When you say astounds people, how many hummingbirds have you seen at one time, for example? Oh, hundreds. Hundreds? Yes. Wow, that must be quite a sight. That was a black chin migration up in uh, central Texas, or mm -hmm. west Texas, but uh, here on the, on the coast, too, you can see hundreds at Rockport during their mm -hmm. festival. Now, I, I think of hummingbirds as being a little contentious. They don't seem to share well. Now, a hundred of them together is kind of hard to imagine. Yes, it's very it's very aggressive, very noisy, very, uh, we'd, we'd consider it quite violent, but uh, <laughs> they are protecting their food source. Mm -hmm. As I tell people, you get the rufous hummingbird that's coming down from Alaska on its way down to central Mexico, mm -hmm. and it's just flown from Alaska to Austin. <laughs> I think if you walked from Alaska to Austin, you'd protect your food, too. <laughs> you'd be a little contentious, right? Yes. Uh, right, a little picky, too, about who you share it with. Exactly. Well, you know, a lot of people want to attract these birds and keep them in their yards for as long as possible. Um, what are the best strategies for doing that? Is it plants? Is it, is it putting out uh, feeders? What do you typically do? All of I, the above? Huh? I definitely prefer the plants over the feeders, but mm -hmm. I do encourage people to use feeders mm -hmm. if, at times, especially during migration, because these birds are flying a long distance, they're stressed, and they're, they're needing a little bit of an extra boost. Okay. But um, if you're really wanting to attract them, you've really got to think about that whole habitat. Mm -hmm. Just putting in those red tubular flowers or uh, putting in a feeder is like taking out an ad in the paper saying, house for sale, great kitchen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nobody's going to buy it. Mm -hmm. You want to make it so that they've got the kitchen, the bedroom, everything they need right, right there in okay. your, your backyard. And so that's why we talk habitat. Okay. Uh, shelter is mainly, for the ruby throat, it's trees, for mm -hmm. the black chinned it's more brush mm -hmm. but it's getting that layered structure that Kelly Bender talks about in her uh, uh, book the Texas Wildscapes. Well, it's interesting that you say that because the spot I always see hummers in my garden is is a kind of a wildscape and it's got lots of Turks cap down below and other kinds of, of flowering plants lots of shrubby plants and some small trees as well. Yes um, Dr. Brent Ortega down in Victoria mm -hmm. uh, did a winter survey over 15 years. Mm -hmm. In that time he caught 12 different species of hummingbird and put bands on them. And he recorded where he found them. Right. He found one that consistently used that typical hummingbird garden. Okay. With ah. the Just, low plants and the trees. Uh-huh. It has to be a kind of step down. It has to be a step a little bit more, more wild looking. Okay, well on the plants that are the food sources, the nectar sources, what are some of your favorite plants to recommend? My favorites are always your natives. Mm -hmm. And we do a hummingbird roundup survey every year that looks at habitat. And one of the things that we've noticed is that our salvias, our native salvias, always show up as number one. 
Oh, really? Okay, good. And then we start down from there. And Turk's Cap, mm -hmm. Trumpet Vine. If you don't want Trumpet Vine, try Cross Vine. Uh -huh. Texas Lantana. Right. Flame Acanthus. Then you might see a non-native showing up. Okay. And the first non-native that's going to show up is that shrimp plant. Okay. Yeah, I've heard from quite a few people, including our producer, that shrimp plant is a favorite. It is, but in some areas I'm starting to see it show up in the wild, so I'm getting a little <laughs> bit concerned. Okay. Oh, yeah, well, it, uh, there is an invasive quality to a lot of these plants. Now, you, uh, we're talking about uh, color preferences from the hummingbird while well, we first were introducing ourselves. And you said that uh, you know there's this standard thing out there about red is the color to use, but you found that, for example, yellow bells is a uh, is a, a crowd pleaser. Yes, yellow bells is definitely a crowd pleaser. Now, when you're talking about attracting them, getting them mm. into your garden, for some reason, red does definitely have a very strong preference there. Okay. But once they're in your garden, once they're moving around your garden, they will hit everything from yellow to blue to pink <laughs> to purple to white. I've even seen them go to black. Mm -hmm. So once they're in your garden, it really doesn't matter the color more, as much as it does whether they've got that right shape and have they got any nectar there. Now you talk about the right shape and you're talking about the flower there. And, yes. then the, and the long tubular flowers are the preferred ones because it knocks out the competition, right? It cuts down on the competition. Mm -hmm. doesn't knock it out. Nothing mm -hmm. knocks it out, but it cuts down on the competition. Mm -hmm. You know, Butterflies, bees have a hard time getting their tongue down into that long mm -hmm. tubular mountain sage right. blossom Bloom, right makes it a little bit more of a challenge for them and okay. makes it possible for the hummingbird to get there we talked about two of the usual suspects the black chinned and the ruby throated um, but there are there are a handful more that are, are fairly common especially seasonally mm -hmm. uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about those the winter rufus is one you mentioned yes the rufus hummingbird is likely to show up here in late august early september and it's likely to be here into April. Mm -hmm. We have had a few show up in May, we've had them show up in June and in July, mm -hmm. but generally it's late August to April. Okay. And then there's also the their cousin, the uh, Allen's hummingbird, right. that is becoming more common in the area, mm -hmm. or at least being seen more commonly in okay. the area. But um, they're very difficult to tell apart. Okay. And so a lot of people just don't even try. They just assume <laughs> they've got a rufus. And okay. we end up with uh, huge numbers of rufus and we're wondering where the hell those allens went. But we, there's also the buff bellied, I understand, is one that people are seeing a lot of. Buff bellied is becoming more and more common, especially to the east of us. Mm -hmm. um, it's shown up a few times here in, the Aust in mm -hmm. Austin itself, but more in Bastrop, uh, down mm -hmm. into Hayes County and over to dripping springs, but uh, it's certainly a possible uh, suspect right. and anymore it's, we used to think of it as one that was right down on the Rio Grande. Right. Anymore, we're seeing it as far north as I've seen pictures on the Red River. Well, and this is a trend that we've talked about that uh, we're starting to see more and more of these subtropical birds coming in into our area, which to me is, is like confirmation that things are getting a little warmer. <laughs> it could be that, it could also be that uh, in a lot of their traditional habitat down in Mexico mm -hmm. is disappearing. Okay. And so sense, they're yeah. looking for new habitat. Okay. So we're seeing some really interesting species, too, that um, are particularly eye-catching, Lucifer and Broadbilled. Lucifer uh, has been recorded a couple of times here in Central Texas. It's more of a West Texas species. Okay. Actually, the best place to see it is right down on the big, on the Rio in mm -hmm. the Big Bend, Bend area, yeah. where you get all that lechuguilla, which is one of their favorite okay. plants. Uh, it does show up in this area once in a while. Mm -hmm. The other one, uh, the uh, broadbilled, broad build, used to be a very common bird in Texas, is, be, is starting to come back. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those birds that after it's finished nesting out in the West, it just shotguns across the United States. Yeah. So it could show up anywhere. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Now let's talk about uh, the nesting habitat for the, the birds. What do they prefer there? We've got two different uh, strategies here in Central Texas. Mm -hmm. The two species that are confirmed nesters here in Central Texas are the ruby-throated mm -hmm. and the black-chinned. Okay. The ruby-throated is very tightly tied to trees. It's got to have trees. It's been generally recorded between 15 and, well, I know of people that have seen them at 45 feet. Wow. Okay. For the nest. And they like to be in trees that 
generally have a very droopy end to the branch so okay. that they build their nest out there on the end of the branch and mm -hmm. if the predators get out there they end up getting dumped off the branch before Ooh, they get to the nest. That makes sense. The black chinned has a different strategy. It prefers brush. It's been recorded generally between five and ten feet off the ground mm -hmm. and it is one that uh, will look for thorny brush. Okay. Thorny brush is their their preference. Just keep those predators away, hide in amongst the thorns. Exactly. Well, it makes a lot of sense. And uh, I know that people are going to be very curious to uh, pick up the book. Again, it's the Hummingbirds of Texas. And uh, it's a topic that is at, at the top of a lot of gardeners' lists. I mean, this is very popular. I'm sure you've had quite a reaction. We have, and we also get quite a reaction to the Hummingbird Roundup, and we can always use more volunteers. Okay, well, uh, people can find out more about that, I'm sure. Uh, on the Parks and Wildlife Red okay. website. All right, very good. Well, thank you so much, Mark, for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Tom. And coming up next is our friend Daphne. Mm -hmm.